my name is Craig Batchelor. I'm the executive director of the Sports Performance Institute. What you're about to see now is over 20 of the leading authorities in sports psychology in relation to sports performance. In addition to these speakers, you're going to see the legendary George Allen, the winningest coach of NFL history. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this fantastic video you're about to see. Thank you. Hi, my name is Diana McNabb and I am the sports psychologist at Seton Hall University and also a professor there. What I'd like to do today is introduce the whole topic of sports psychology and sports nutrition. Do you know that one out of every five Americans is overweight and out of shape? Every single person in this room is going to consume over 130 pounds of pure sugar alone. You consume over 60 pounds of fats a year and you are totally out of control of your nutritional choices. We are marketed and brainwashed by the major corporations in our company into thinking that candies and sodas and fast foods are good for us and that will help our performance and our lifestyles. In reality, what you put into your body will determine what you get out of your body. We are a living species. We are filled with 70% of water base. Unless the food has been alive at some point in its life or has water in it, it is doing us no nutritional goodness. For example, where do you think all the good food lives in the grocery store? It lives on the perimeter. Why? Because it's alive, it has to be removed every day, it has to be watered, it has to be plucked from its molds. Living food has to be played with and has to be taken care of. 70% of your diets should come from the perimeter of the grocery store. So what kinds of foods are those? Those are fruits and vegetables, whole grains, pastas, meat, fish and chicken, low fat dairy products and all of your breads. The number one food source for athletes is complex carbohydrates, which comes from the living foods on the perimeter. Where do you think all the bad foods live in your grocery store? Up and down the aisles, marketed at your eye level. Guess what's marketed at Susie's eye level and she's five years old? All the gum and the candy and the cereals that are advertised on Saturday morning television, marketed at Susie's eye level and she thinks that those are the only foods for her. It's high salt, high sugar, high fat, and prevents tremendous, promotes tremendous mood swings. What's marketed at mommy's eye level? All the distinctive gourmet Pepperidge Farms cookie. All the most expensive food items in the whole grocery store are marketed at mom's eye level. Why? Because she'll spend the money on herself and she's looking for that little something special that's gonna make her feel better. So what's marketed at dad's eye level? Dad's the kind of guy that sits on the couch on Sunday afternoon and he's having his Miller Lite beer and he reaches for pretzels, popcorn, potato chips and all the salty foods are marketed as his high level. The reality is it's not your fault but if you eat without thinking it's going to have a negative effect on your lifestyle. Do you know that one can of soda dehydrates you rather than hydrates you? It's filled with carbon dioxide, which is a waste toxin that we expel out of our mouths. It's filled with chemicals, preservatives, salts, and sugars. And when it goes into your stomach, it literally zaps the water out of your body to try to digest it. So soda is not the drink of champions. Water is the number one source of hydration. Everybody should be drinking six to eight cups of water to a day if they want to feel good and look good. Do you know that aging is dehydration from the inside out? So ladies, forget all the face creams and just start drinking water. The athlete's diet should incorporate two pieces of fresh fruit a day. Bananas, oranges and apples are filled with vitamin C, magnesium, potassium and are wonderful for digestion and for an electrolyte balance. Every athlete should eat one dark green salad a day with a light salad dressing on it for minerals and also drink six to eight glasses of water. If you just incorporated this into your diet, it could make a major difference in your lifestyle. Do you know that a Big Mac fries and shakes is 98% fat, has 13 teaspoons of sugar in it and 13 teaspoons of oil in just one McDonald's meal? So what happens to the fat when it goes in your body? Men store their fat cells around the middle. It's called the Miller Lite love handle. And as guys get older, their Miller Lite love handle gets bigger and bigger. The reality is, is that male's adipose tissue is right around the middle. Where do women store their fat? It's called mountain derriere. All the women's fat cells are around their middles. So if they're eating high fat diets, it can't dissolve in a water soluble body and so it gets stored as fat. So the reality is, is that athletes need a low fat diet and high in complex carbohydrates. 
So what are complex carbohydrates? They're all the foods that have been alive in their life and are water soluble from the perimeter of the grocery store. The breakfast, lunch, and dinner of champions will be low in fats, high in fruits, vegetables, grains, pastas, potatoes, and rice, and that will go into their muscles as glycogen and promote winners and champions because you can only exercise at the level of your glycogen level. These are just a few tips on sports nutrition. I hope you got something out of it. And if you're interested in more, stay tuned. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Mel Hankinson, and I'd like to share with you some ideas on a systematic approach to motivation. Motivation is stimulation that sets people into action. Our motivational base that most people use would be that of a neglectful teacher coach, a permissive teacher coach, the authoritarian type coach, the authoritative type coach. Most coaches and teachers fall into these two areas. The authoritarian type coach is believed, he believes that people need to be coerced uh, into uh, and driven uh, to reach their maximum potential. Most reinforcement is given uh, by negative criticism and, and because of the authorita uh, authoritarian structure, this is extrinsic type of motivation. The authoritative type coach is someone, is a type of teacher who believes that if you give the student direction that they will achieve even beyond their own expectations. Most of the reinforcement is positive and most of the criticism uh, is positive and most of the, and what we're trying to develop is from the inside out. That's called intrinsic motivation. Next, as a teacher coach, you want to identify specifically for your group what motivational areas that, you, uh, that you'd like to have developed. Then communicate with all your players, uh, either by slogans, charts, or we like to use a self-image checklist where the players have an opportunity to buy into our motivational system. Lastly, challenge, I challenge myself as I challenge you to stress total effort and strive for excellence in everything you do to become the very best that you can possibly become. Hello, I'm Richard Cox, professor and director of the School of Physical Education at Ball State University. I'm an educational and research sports psychologist. In sport, attention, or what many people call concentration, is the heart and soul of successful athletic performance. Let me explain. Successful athletes focus completely and exclusively on the task at hand. And if you have noticed in any athletic endeavor that the successful athletes tend to be so focused that it's as if they cannot see or think of any other thing. Why can this be? This is a very difficult thing when you consider all the possible distractions that an athlete has. For example, in a game situation, there's the crowd, there's the other team, there's your own teammates, there's the referee, there's the call the referee made, there's the last play, all of these things are potential distractors from the athlete's performance, yet the successful athlete is able to gate out all of those irrelevant cues and focus on the thing that's most important. How can this be is based on a principle of psychology. The athlete can only focus on one thing at a time, can only provide quality attention to one thing at one time. One of the procedures that sports psychologists use to help the athlete de deal with a, an attentional situation is called thought stopping and centering. Take a situation like basketball free throw shooting where the athlete is needing to focus but a negative thought may come into his mind. For example, I might miss. There are three steps that the athlete can use to use the principle of attention. One is to relax, two is to replace the negative thought with a positive thought, and the third is to focus on a task relevant cue. What I'm going to do now is provide an example of how this can be done by the athlete.
And so in, a, in an intentional situation for athletic performance, the first thing the athlete does And so in this example of thought stopping and centering, the athlete may think to himself, I'm going to miss. It's a thought that comes into the minds and hearts of many athletes in a critical game situation. Using the principle of focusing and attention, the athlete can eliminate that negative thought by replacing it with a positive thought. But first he, may, he must attempt through deep breathing and expelling air as if it was tension to eliminate, eliminate that negative thought through relaxation and then thinking of a positive thought such as, say to yourself, I am a great shooter and I can do it. Follow this at the same time with a cue, a task related cue that will help the athlete to attend to something other than a negative thought. In this case, the suggestion is that the athlete would think in terms of bending the knees and following through. And so in this process, by focusing on a positive thought and attending to a task relevant cue, the athlete can gate out or eliminate the negative cue that could have caused an error in their performance. And so I'd like to end this short presentation in the same way that I began it, and that is by stating that attention, or what we coaches often tie times call concentration is the heart and soul of successful athletic performance. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Alan Goldberg and I'm a sports psychologist and the director of Competitive Advantage. And Competitive Advantage is a consulting firm that works with all levels of athletes and coaches to help them enhance performance and overcome blocks. And today what I'd like to do is I'd like to present a model for coaches and athletes to be able to use to help them overcome performance blocks and also overcome slumps. The model is based on the work that I've been doing over the last two or three years with individual athletes and teams that are in slumps. Now I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about what I see as the cyclical nature of a performance slump. Very often times in my work I see that performance slumps are really caused because of mental factors and they're actually generated or, or kept in motion by the athlete, by the athlete's thoughts, self-talk, and negative imagery. And on the graph here, what I'd like you to see is that oftentimes the uh, performance slump will begin with a failure, a poor performance, or even an injury. Uh, the injury, the performance, the failure will generate negative self-talk in the athlete. The athlete will put themselves down, will berate themselves, that in turn leads to self-doubts. They'll begin to question their ability, they'll be get, getting into what I call selective distortion, which is really just they have a tendency to block out their successes and focus only on their failures. That in turn leads to diminished self-confidence and as far as performance goes, an athlete will perform directly in proportion to how they feel about themselves. And if you have an athlete that doesn't feel good about their performance, they're not going to perform well, doesn't feel good about them. Um, the diminished self-confidence leads to negative beliefs or expectations of future failure. They get into expecting that because they had one bad performance, it's going to lead to another. This in turn disrupts their focus of concentration. And it's clear that concentration is the key to athletic excellence. Without an ability to focus in on what's important and block out everything else, an athlete will never reach their potential. The disrupted concentration, the negative beliefs, the diminished self-confidence leads to the final step in this cycle, which is the athlete gets into what I call a trying harder mentality. They try to muscle their way through the performance. They become too conscious of the performance. It's really interesting if you look at uh, athletes who are experiencing peak performances, they're not in a trying harder mentality, they're in a um, letting it happen or trusting mentality and um, the motions are on automatic. They're not thinking about what they're doing. When the athlete gets into trying harder, uh, they're too conscious of the performance and they're setting themselves up for failure. After the trying harder, what, what happens is there's another poor performance and then the whole cycle starts all over again. And it's, it's interesting because most playing slumps and most performance slumps, if we're talking about an individual athlete, 
become repetitive. It's like a, re a broken record, or a record that skips, actually. The, the record goes over and over and over again in the same way. And the coach's function, the coach's task, is to interrupt that pattern. Uh, as a hypnotist, the way I like to look at a performance slump is the athlete actually goes into a trance state and they go through the same things over and over and over again. And the coach has to try to help get them out. Now, the model that I like to talk about in terms of um, how they would go and, and do that, how they would facilitate that is, is right over here. The first, the, the first task that the coach has is to rule out the physical or technical. In other words, the coach has to make sure that the performance difficulty is, related, is not related to uh, faulty technique or poor conditioning. For example, if an athlete runs out of steam consistently at the end of a game, uh, it, is that because they're too tense? Or is it really because their conditioning needs a tremendous amount more work? Once a uh, coach has done that, they know for sure that the performance problems uh, the performance problems are not related to physical, then they have to go through the following steps, which I'll very briefly outline here. They have to help the athlete become aware of how they keep themselves blocked. In other words, they have to help the athlete determine what their faulty mental strategies are, what their thoughts, self-talk, and images are that propel or perpetuate the block. They then have to help the athlete understand that the block is merely a result of using those faulty strategies. Uh, they have to make sure that they challenge the athlete's faulty beliefs. An athlete in a performance slump is an athlete who's lost faith in themselves. They don't believe it's possible. The uh, coach has to help challenge that. And then uh, going through the rest of these, I'm only going to really highlight the two most important. They have to help the athlete restore proper focus or concentration. An athlete who is in a slump is always focusing on cues like past mistakes or outcome, future, the what ifs. Uh, that focus is almost going to ensure that the block continues. So it's critical a coach work with the concentration as well as working with restoring the athlete's imagery. Uh, to uh, an athlete who's in a performance slump is an athlete whose imagery is negative. It's failure oriented. Athletes see what they're afraid will happen when they're in slumps instead of what they want to have happen. Uh, again, the, the, the purpose of this block is I'm not, the, the model is I'm not presenting anything that's new. It's just a combination of using these techniques in a system to, to attack an a, a athlete who's blocked or to attack a slumping team. So I want to thank you very much for your time and stay tuned. I'm Jack Stark. I'm a sports psychologist at the University of Nebraska where I work with the Nebraska football and basketball teams. I've also worked with numerous other athletes in the state of Nebraska. I'm going to talk today about a mental performance skills program, a program that I've introduced and used with the elite athletes. It's important to look at what we're trying to develop in terms of a 3 to 5 percent performance enhancement goals. We call this program the Mental Performance Skills, or MEPS. At the Division I level that I've been working at, a 3 to 5 percent is a significant change uh, at, at that level in terms of the overall team performance. It's important to look at this in relationship to the other concepts uh, and other factors involved in a total team performance. Natural athletic talent maybe accounts for 65 percent. Coaching will take us to 80 percent. Use of trainers and physicians up to 85, strength coaches 90, academic counselors up to 95. The last part, the, the sports psychology mental performance skills program really can make the difference in a winning or losing season. In Nebraska, for example, we lost two national championships on two separate plays over the years. Athletics is evolving, evolving over the years. In the 50s, we developed a coaching specialization. In the 60s, we were seeing the introduction of athletic trainers. In the 70s were strength programs, academic counselors in the 80s. In the 90s, we're seeing the introduction of sports psychologists, and they're going to grow and more in the future. To be effective, though, we must take into consideration some of the obstacles to success for sports psychologists. We don't always have enough time with athletes, a lot of financial pressures, a lot of athletes to work with, and yet the things that we do are not always generalized and developed and used on and off the field. The program I've tried to look at in with Nebraska is to look at a number of mental skills um, techniques. I've developed these into a 20 uh, skill factors and have the athletes evaluate them and grade them and rank them and develop uh, uh, programs and materials for them. All the way from visualization, imagery, arousal, uh, peak performance, goal setting, um, all the way down to uh, 
personality profiling, uh, performance evaluation, and personal skills. I had to rank these, identify them, then I developed individual materials. I developed a, a program of audio cassette tapes. Every player in a team gets them. They're both individualized for them. Some of them have their own voices. Some of them have the voices of their coach. Um, the relaxation techniques all the way to hypnosis, peak performance, etc. It's important to develop a program, a consistent uh, program. Uh, I've given an example here of football where we have a three-phase approach in working with the team. In the spring, we look at the major goal as education, helping the athletes understand what the program is about. Each week, I break it down in, from orientation, assessing the players, and then selecting what kinds of skills and methods we're going to work on uh, before we're done with spring ball, both individually and as a unit. During the summer then, I try to develop an acquisition goal where we follow a very structured program. I use the packets with each of the players. Uh, I have individual sessions with them, sometimes small group sessions. Get to begin to talk with the coaches, what they want me to do with their individual players, in particular units such as the linebackers, receivers, etc. When the fall time comes then, we develop these skills into a systematic routine. We assess our progress over the summer. We work with the players the night before, the day before, the morning of, uh, have a very consistent uh, program uh, developing relaxation, training, visualization, etc. Another example is in the basketball program where I've developed a six-step approach uh, at the Nebraska uh, basketball team. In April, we develop what the role of the sports psychologist is. We review our mental performance skills training programs. In May, we evaluate the athletes, look at their strengths and weaknesses. In June, we set up individual sessions with goals, uh, evaluate them. And then during the summer months, we give them the training packets, and they work systematically from uh, attitude training, relaxation, confidence building, mental toughness. Once the preseason comes, then we develop the team cohesiveness, relationship with our teammates, coaches. We have uh, group sessions, um, sometimes six or seven hours. And then we get into our final step, which is the preparation before the game, the week before, night before, etc. All of these uh, factors come together, develop uh, what we refer to as a comprehensive mental skills program. It can make a major difference in terms of the team's overall performance from 3 to 5 percent. A couple of free throws, a drop ball can make the difference between winning the national championship or finishing in the middle of your league. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bill Straub, sports psychologist at Ithaca College, Ithaca, New York. It is my pleasure today to talk about a very important topic in sports psychology called sport leadership. It's a neglected variable. We talk about everything else except the coach as a leader. Since our time is limited today, I'd like to start with a definition of leadership. Although in the 1950s and 60s, leadership was thought about as a dominance process where the coach dominated players to reach important goals, today, leadership is viewed more as an influence process where the coach points the way, so to speak, for the team to achieve individual and team goals. I'd like to also discuss what I consider to be some important guidelines for the coach to follow in leading athletes. The first is, I think, you have to be yourself. There's no use trying to emulate someone else. It is through our own personalities that we get the job done. Vince Lombardi said, that leaders must win the hearts of people, and they usually do that through their own individual personalities. The next important thing is to surround yourself with a capable staff of assistant coaches. And when you hire the assistant coaches, it's very important that you hire people with diverse abilities and competencies which will make up for your own individual weaknesses. The leader should also be very positive in everything he or she does. It is through a positive approach to athletic uh, leadership that players will attain high standards of athletic excellence. Another th pervasive theme that appears in the leadership literature, which is of course very voluminous, is that the coach must be a good teacher. Coaches must teach the, not only the fundamentals of the sport, but also the intricate systems of offense and defensive play. The coach's teacher continues to be a central theme as we look at leadership over the last 50 or 60 years. Leaders must also not only teach well, but they must communicate well. They must work with their teams, 
They must communicate to their teams what is important, what is less important, and also obtain the feedback from their athletes about what they perceive is taking place and how the coach can better do his or her job. Planning, organization, and then working that plan is the essence of good leadership. All good leaders know how important it is to plan what you want to do, to organize that plan, and then to put that plan into operation. Next, the use of time management. Time is the essence of coaching. There's so, so much to cover and so little time to do it. So good leaders are using time management procedures so that they can be more effective in meeting the individual and team needs. I believe the modern coach works within the team rather than outside of the team. He or she has a special rapport with their players. They sit down, they talk about how the team is going, they interchange ideas, and they are more effective because the team becomes motivated, more motivated than if the coach were to dominate this process. I think good leaders have to continually study and be students of their sport. They must stay up to date. They must go to coaching clinics. They must read the literature. They must learn from other coaches. They must watch a lot of television. And they're always open to new ideas and innovations which will help their particular players. To be continually excited about what you're doing is the essence of good coaching. Well, as the years go by, to keep your enthusiasm high to maintain that desire and willingness to pay the price for what it takes to be successful is the mark of all great coaches. Knowing each player on an individual basis is also very important. Some people say that before you can motivate anyone, you must know that player. You must know his or her strengths and weaknesses or desires. So knowing the player is the first step and motivating him or her. Use of, of uh, your own best approach to motivation, that is the thing that works for you. Uh, I think the thing that players worry about more than anything else is what the coach is going to say, what he or she is going to think, and how he or she is going to behave when the team loses. I think we must talk with our players about losing and what to expect when we lose. I like the coach who says, let's take the game to the other team, let's give 100%, and if things don't turn out well for us, we're going to regroup, we're going to come back tomorrow, there's going to be no scapegoating, we're going to continue to pursue excellence in a very special way. Although these are not the only concerns of sport leadership, they are certainly some of the most important ones. Leadership, like other phases of sports psychology, continues to be a very important topic, a topic that should receive a lot more of attention than it has. Unfortunately, it seems that modern approaches to coaching, we talk about everything except leadership. We talk about drawing bigger O's and X's. We talk about motivation. We talk about personality. We talk about violence and aggression. Very seldom do we ever talk about this most important topic called sport leadership. Best of wishes to you in motivating and leading your team. Motivating today's student athlete. How do you do it? Can you do it? Are there some secret magic formulas to it? Hi, I'm Steve Brennan with Peak Performance Consultants in Omaha, Nebraska. And today I'm going to give you 10 key elements of the motivation process. The first key, be yourself. It's very important that you use your own personality in your motivation techniques. If you're soft-spoken, then you better stay soft-spoken. If you're a, a wild type of person, you're very outgoing and gregarious, then that'll be part of it too. But the idea is don't be someone that you're not. Be yourself. The second big key, become a better listener. How many times has this happened to you? Something's gone wrong on the field, maybe in the classroom with the student athletes. You have your own preconceived ideas what went on. You really, you will listen, you will listen what the player has to say, but you won't really hear what they have to say. 
Let them say everything that they want. Let them say everything right out in the open. Be a good listener. That'll help you be a good motivator also. The third point, become an assertive motivator. And by assertive, I mean don't be afraid to ask your student athletes what you want them to do. Some coaches are afraid to come out and say exactly what they want to say. Make sure you're...